Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here, let's talk boxing. I do want to bring you guys a technical breakdown video for the Canelo Charlo fight and some of the other fights that are taking place over the course of the weekend. I really hope I have time to do that guys, I'm sorry I've been swept off my feet with work this week. However, in the meantime, I am going to bring you another video which I'm sure has got everybody very excited. Tyson Fury versus Alexander Usyk for the Undisputed Heavyweight Championship of the World has been signed. Both teams have reported this. It's been confirmed by all involved. I know there's a few cynics out there that are saying, well, no date has been announced. So I don't believe it until they touch gloves. Look, when it comes to dates, a contract can still be signed. And what happens is you will have a series of potential dates and the fight has to occur on one of those. But they've yet to agree it, potentially because of the Fury and Ganu fight. So December 23rd is one of the dates that they're talking about. Let's say they're also looking at a potential of January the 13th and February the 3rd. If Fury was to get cut by Nganu, for argument's sake, it might take a certain period of time for him to recover before he can safely start camp, in which case they'll look towards the latter dates for that fight. If he comes through unscathed, then they might say, right, let's go on December 23rd. So I wouldn't look at the fact that a date has yet to be announced as some sort of sign that the fight hasn't been signed. It's been confirmed by all parties involved it has been signed. Now, I want to ask you guys why you think this fight has been signed now. This is not a case of the... Mayweather Pacquiao situation where it went on for years the negotiations and by the time the fight came around most people felt as though Pacquiao was way past his best it's not like Spence and Crawford which also went on for a number of years and it was actually Team Spence that seemed to be delaying it and by the time the fight came around it was actually Spence that seems not to be physically the guy he used to be it's not even a case of Anthony Joshua against Deontay Wilder, whereby the fight has been touted for a number of years. We were then told it was locked in, and then we're told actually the fight is now looking increasingly unlikely to happen. Although I am secretly harboring optimistic hopes that that will get over the line, especially now that this has been signed. The fact of the matter is, this fight was supposed to take place in April. Yeah, sure, may have taken place even earlier than that in January, but that means that it's either five months or nine months after the fight was due to take place where they've signed. And if it does indeed happen in December or January, you're talking about it being a year out at most compared to when we were expecting the fight to take place. So why is it occurring now? It's not as though we've seen Alexander Usyk get washed and way past his best and Fury's thinking he's there for the taking. A lot of people are pointing to the fact that he was dropped by Daniel Dubois. Most of us felt that that shot was low rather than legitimate and that Usyk made a meal of it. Even if you think it was a legitimate shot to the body, Fury's not really the sort of guy that throws that type of punch. He's a very tall, six foot eight, six foot nine heavyweight who's got long limbs. He would have to really bend down at the legs, at the knees, and throw this big, wide, curving, bolo type of uppercut in order to get that shot off. He's not going to have that compact sort of power when he's throwing it. And Alex Krasiuk himself has said that if he tried anything like that with Alexander Usyk, because he's so much taller, he would actually bring his head into punch and range and he could get himself knocked out. So I don't buy into this idea that Fury has suddenly had this revelation, particularly as Usyk has been susceptible to the body people have claimed for a number of years. I recently did a video where I was debunking and rubbishing this idea that Alexander Usyk somehow has a glass body. The video is still up for all to see. By the same token, if either one of these two fighters has shown somewhat of a decline, Perhaps it's Tyson Fury that showed more of a decline compared to his peak than Alexander Usyk compared to his peak. The canvas was wet in the fight against Dubois and it clearly affected their movement. But even with that in mind, Usyk still looked like he was moving very well. And when he was in the pocket against a bigger, physically stronger, power punching, younger heavyweight, natural heavyweight in Daniel Dubois, Usyk still had the ability to make himself invisible with some great defense and to land hard, powerful, accurate shots and stop the bigger man. He showed the ability not just to move away on the back foot, but stay in the pocket and be destructive against the natural heavyweight. Tyson Fury, on the other hand, perhaps his legs aren't what they used to be, and perhaps his stamina isn't what it used to be. He's He was gassing a lot more, it seemed, in the Deontay Wilder third fight than he was in their second meeting, for instance. So if the people that felt that that was the case, and that's why he was afraid of fighting Alexander Usyk, felt that that's the reason he didn't want to take the fight... Well, why would he suddenly want to take the fight if Usyk hasn't truly shown signs of decline? So, why the fight now? In my opinion, this just reinforces the position that I've always taken. That initially, it's true, Tyson Fury did not seem to want a fight. And I believed Babich's claims 
that Tyson Fury seemed to be harboring a lot of injuries and that he couldn't get physically fit. And he knows that Alexander Usyk is a significant threat to him. Despite all the narrative about being a blown up middleweight, Fury knows he has to be at his best. And so he started to put a series of obstacles in the way to drag his feet. And potentially, if they knew about the Nganu fight as a potential two, he might have thought, that's a nice little money grab. Let me take that fight before I go into the Alexander Usyk fight. Nonetheless, from Alexander Usyk's perspective, he did jump through hoops. And it seemed as though there was one final hurdle to jump over. The final split. Now, whether Fury was secretly not training or not, and he was never willing to take that fight, that's neither here or there from Usyk's perspective. If you've cornered somebody in negotiations, surely you're then going to pull the trigger with that final moment of negotiation. He didn't. He walked away. And I always felt there was something else going on behind the scenes. And then it emerged that Skills Challenge had signed him. So he gets this monster contract. And I guarantee you now, both Usyk and Fury will be making a lot more money from this fight than they would have if they had fought in January initially or even in April. But if you disagree and you think Fury is still afraid of Alexander Usyk, let me know why in the comment sections down below. This fight has finally been signed now. Now, me trying to always be fair with the way I've reported on this had led to many people calling me a Tyson Fury fanboy despite the fact that I'd been critical of Fury throughout the course of this whole saga and one of the things that I've also been critical about is the wider heavyweight division and explaining how for me the B status level guys are not taking any sort of risks they're not fighting each other they're not taking fights that you as a fan are excited about where you think oh I wonder how this fight could go I give this guy a 30% chance 35% chance of pulling off an upset which means makes you want to watch it instead we're seeing fights whereby it's pretty much guaranteed what the outcome's going to be before they step into the ring and even that has led to some people accusing me of being a fanboy of fury somehow seeking to protect tyson fury even though these two things are not related at all in fact as recently as yesterday before this undisputed title fight was announced Tyson Fury was speaking to Rio Ferdinand and he was discussing the Nganu fight and he said the biggest risk in fighting an MMA fighter is that he's the heavyweight champion of the world and what happens if he beats me? I'd be ridiculed. It would be like Man United getting beaten 7-0 off Liverpool. And I put out a tweet where I laughed at the football banter there because for the football fans out there, you'll know that that actually happened. So he's uh, winding the scousers up a little bit there and I said it was superb. But humour and charisma isn't going to hoodwink the hardcore fans. This is a money grab. And if Usyk doesn't happen next, the public will never forgive Tyson Fury. He'll regret it in years to come. So that's always been my position. But the heavyweight division, to me, exists beyond just the champions. And this applies for all divisions in boxing. It's the same reason when Benavidez was saying that Canelo was ducking him, I was saying, hold on a sec, there are so many other contenders out there who claim to be worthy of a shot at Canelo. You've not fought anybody yet. You need to go and get in there with somebody. And he went and fought Caleb Plant. And now he's talking about potentially fighting Morel. Because now Canelo fighting somebody like Charlo, how can Benavides say you're ducking me? Charlo's a big test as well. And the reason he can't say it is because he doesn't have the severity and the gravitas in his CV to be able to make that claim. And so me being critical of some of the other B status guys is not a protection of Fury. I'm not saying Fury shouldn't fight Sanchez or Makhmadov and instead should fight Nganu. But as a boxing fan that's interested in the sport beyond just the champions, I want to see a Eubank Smith type of heavyweight fight. Two guys that are B status guys, sure. Now I want to see Eubank go and get a, a, a title shot against Aleem Kanuli. But he took a risk by fighting a B status guy in the interim. You see, here's the thing that people need to realize. When you look at the heavyweight rankings, don't allow yourself to be hoodwinked by a lot of these fighters and their promoters who will claim, oh yeah, I beat a top 10 guy. If you were to look at the four governing bodies across the board and you were to count how many fighters are in the heavyweight top 10, there are 23 different names. Now, we know it's impossible for 23 fighters to genuinely be top 10 fighters. In other words, you can go and beat somebody who's just inside the top 10 or well inside the top 10 in some cases within one specific governing body. And in reality, he's in the periphery of the top 25. So imagine Tyson Fury hadn't signed to fight Alexander Usyk. And instead, after fighting Nganu, he said, listen, I'm going to take on a real test now. A really big name in the top 10. I'm going to go and fight Ajit Kabayel. I'm going to go and fight Manuel Char. I'm going to go and fight David Adelaide, who's also in the top 10, even though he's about to fight domestically for the British title, right? 
If he was to take any of those sorts of fights, Pero, Pero's ranked at number four with one of the governing bodies. The dude's had nine fights. How many of you would be accepting of that? You would be critical. You'd be saying, this is ridiculous. This is Tyson Fury taking on a gimme fight. And you see, here's the irony. Many of you will say, but hold on a sec, Chris. Anthony Joshua was due to fight D uh, Dillian White. You also had Andy Ruiz in talks with Deontay Wilder. So the next highest ranked guy, which is the guidelines provided by the WBC, even though they bend their rules all the time, is Frank Sanchez at number four. Well, Sanchez was then leapfrogged by Arslan Bek Makhmadov, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And he didn't fight anybody of note either in order to leapfrog him. Let's say you therefore believe that the governing bodies are subject to influence by fighters that are stars and by big name promoters and stuff like that. And that's why they didn't demand that the Wilder Ruiz fight negotiations be given an extension of three months. That's why they haven't called a mandatory for Tyson Fury. Well, if you believe that, then surely you would also accept that it's possible for that same heavyweight to turn around and say, I don't actually fancy Frank Sanchez. He's a little bit difficult for me stylistically. I'd rather fight Makhmadov. So let Makhmadov fight some sort of bum. Or better yet, how about Manuel Char? Let Manuel Char fight some sort of bum. The sort of guy that Frank Sanchez and Makhmadov have been fighting. And let him jump up to number four in the world. And then I can get a shot against him. Can you see why that would be a problem? So rather than have a situation whereby you just trust the whims of any given governing body, surely as fans we should be demanding that these B-status guys actually earn a good position. That way when they do get a title shot, you know that as a fight fan you're going to see a proper fight. Again, let me reiterate, I'm not saying Tyson Fury shouldn't fight any of these guys and go and fight Francis and Gannon. No, you can still be critical of Fury and his conduct. But as a fight fan who's interested in beyond just the champions, I want to see the B status guys take some sort of a risk too. Let me show you exactly what it is that I'm talking about. Arslan Bek Makhmadov, who I've been raving about as a physical phenomenon who's going to bring some real war to the division for a number of years now. Let's look at his CV. His last fight, he beat Rafael Akpajori. 15-0, looks good on paper, right? You're talking about a guy who was a former basketball player and has crossed over. You're just an athletic guy. Had no business being in the ring against Makhmadov. That's the win that enabled him to jump up to number four in the world to leapfrog Frank Sanchez. Why? His best win is Carlos Takam. A Carlos Takam who's now way past his best. A very good fighter who gives everybody a test. A Derek Chisora type of guy. A Derev Yanchenko type of guy, right? But he's an old man now and he beat him on points. His next fight... Is against a guy called Agron Smakici, the number two Croatian heavyweight behind Hergovic, of course. He has a record of 19 and 2. And when you look at this guy's record, he was stopped last year by, sorry, this year by Ajit Kabayel inside three rounds. His only other step up came against Zan Kosobutski a few years ago, and he got stopped inside a single round. This is the guy that Makhmadov is stepping in the ring with after fighting a basketball player? Me being critical of this is somehow a defense of Tyson Fury? Why? Just because I want to see good fighters like Makhmadov inside fights that are not decided before he steps into the ring? Let's look at Frank Sanchez as an example. Another guy who for a number of years I've been speaking very highly about. A heavyweight that can actually move, get on his toes, be light, can lure you onto shots. A very, very good fighter. Well, Frank Sanchez, his last victory was against Daniel Martz inside one round. This is a dude that was stopped by the British champion, Fabio Wardley, in two rounds. Marx couldn't even last two rounds at domestic level in the UK. Prior to that, he'd fought journeymen like Carlos Negron and Christian Hammer. And there was a time when Hammer was a decent guy. He was European level heavyweight, right? But he's way past his best now. It was with eight defeats that he went in there against Frank Sanchez and he lost the fight on points. Before that, there was the one good victory on Sanchez's CV, and that was F.A. Ajagba. Now, I am, and have always been, suspect of Ajagba's ability. I do not believe he's genuinely a top 10 heavyweight. I think he's one of those that is a beneficiary, I guess you could say, of being ranked highly when he doesn't really deserve it in terms of his abilities. And nonetheless, he was a top 10 heavyweight at the time. That's great. That's his one victory that occurred in 2021 that had anything of note to it. What makes Frank Sanchez stand out above the likes of the other 23 heavyweights that find themselves in the top 10? 
His next opponent is Scott Alexander. 17 and 5. He's inactive, so Box Rec don't even rank him. But I say he's inactive. He fought a year ago in 2022 against Gilles Zhang. And he lasted less than one round. How is this somehow a defense of Tyson Fury by saying it's unacceptable that they're fighting these guys? Put them in against somebody who has some sort of pulse. Let them fight guys where it's going to grow their status and their stock so that other fans can turn around and say, you know what, I'm really excited about Frank Sanchez. I want to see him in there against Tyson Fury. By blowing out Scott Alexander, what is that going to achieve for his career and for us as fight fans having this concept of a mouth-watering fight coming up? Let me know what you think, ladies and gents. Hopefully the rest of the heavyweight division can follow suit. Let's hope we see the rest of the heavyweight division pull its socks up now. Let me know what you think, ladies and gents. Please don't forget to hit a stiff jab on the like button, a right cross on the subscribe button, and an uppercut on the notifications button. Thanks for watching. Chat to you soon. Take care. God bless.